the bed. <gasps> Holy shit! These videos are not for children. If you're a children, then piss off. Hey there, it's me, your least favorite YouTuber, V Infuso. Here to talk about what I believe is without a doubt one of the most underrated Batman movies of all time. I think this one flew under the radar for most, no bat pun intended, and those who did see it were just kind of meh about the whole ordeal. But trust me, this is it. Batman Gotham by Gaslight is an adaptation of the book of the very same name. But I'm using that term very loosely here, as this story is very loosely adapted from that comic book. As a matter of fact, when all is said and done, these two stories have much more to contrast than they do to compare. They're much more different than they are alike. Basically, all the movie and the book have in common outside of a title, are the time period it takes place in, and the character's design. But otherwise, they're two entirely different experiences. I do intend on covering the comic book here on the channel, so if that's something you might be interested, let me know in the comment section by leaving a comment saying, Gotham by Gaslighting. Like I said, they're not all gonna be intelligent or particularly well thought out, but these weird code words, they help me out a lot. You guys help guide me down the right path on this channel. Think of yourselves as the gaslight to my lantern. Boo this man! Let me be real with you, I usually save this for the end, but I love this movie. Firstly, I'm a sucker for Elseworld stories. Especially when those stories have a good story to tell, or interesting ways of reinventing characters. And this movie is chock full of that. I think they have some really interesting uses and reimaginings for certain Batman characters. Having the original three Robins team together as a street gang of orphans. Showcasing Poison Ivy as a burlesque dancer with the leaf gimmick. Having Catwoman as a nightclub performer and a sort of advocate of women. And Hugo Strange is... No, well, Hugo Strange just kind of stays the same, but, but he's wearing a hat now, so there is that. And having Leslie Tompkins serve the role as a nun as opposed to a doctor seems fitting for this time period, as I'd imagine there weren't too many female doctors. They're all great. Sure, most of these characters don't play major roles, but they do find a place in the story and their presence is never too distracting. It'd be far too easy to make them all unnecessary cameos. But most of them serve some sort of purpose, even if it's not that much of one. I like how in order to properly fit in with the times, a whole bunch of characters are intentionally worsened. Like, this is the sleaziest interpretation of Harvey Dent ever put to film. Bruce, I'm in love. Well, that's great news, Harvey. I'm sure your wife will be glad to hear it. They make mention of him acting like two different people, but if that's the case, then both of them suck. And Harvey Bullock... Well, no, Harvey Bullock pretty much stays the same. Except now we have the added benefit of seeing him with a handlebar mustache and mutton chops. Seeing these variations of these characters does a whole lot to allow us to better understand this version of Gotham City. And it also emphasizes that despite the change of scenery, this still is in fact Gotham City. The characters feel like the characters we've grown up watching and reading. Just time error appropriate. Except for one or two characters who have gone through some immense changes, but, but I think they're warranted in their own unique way. We'll get to that later. It walks the line of being completely different, but all too similar. Now it's not all great. This movie does have its faults. I will admit the animation does look like it's a little bit cheap. Some corners have definitely been cut, and they found a way to work around a budget. But I still think that they did a serviceable job, and it's... alright. It's not the best, but it's not like it's awful. It's just okay. But I think this movie makes up for whatever blemishes it has. The money may not have gone into making this look like a great Batman movie, but at least it went into securing the right people to make this a great Batman movie. You have a top-notch voice cast. You got Dexter's sister as Selina Kyle, and she is perfect. Now, I wrote down to purr on perfect, but at last minute, I realized that I was neither a cat nor a woman. It didn't feel right in any context. Giles from Buffy is playing Alfred, which is just as great as it sounds. Spider-Man is Harvey Dent. The dude from Gilmore Girls plays Commissioner Gordon. At least I think he's from Gilmore Girls. I've never seen the show, but I saw commercials, so... I'm gonna assume that that's him. I might be wrong. We'll check and post. They even brought in Grey DeLisi and Tara Strong to voice other characters. Not to mention that Bruce Greenwood is back as Batman. 
Let me tell you, you cannot go wrong with having Bruce voice Bruce. It just, it's too great. Dude always does his part and does it well. I didn't include him in my initial top five Batman. If I got the chance to redo it all again, I definitely would. That was a huge mistake on my part. It's hard to single out one good performance with this cast of people because everybody is so on point for this. I think if I had to just pick one or two, it'd probably be Batman and Catwoman. I was genuinely surprised to learn that Jennifer Carpenter was the woman behind Catwoman. It's not the kind of performance I would expect out of her based on some of her previous work, but man, she really nails the role, and I would not mind seeing her return to the character in some form or another. Honestly, I'm a little bit bummed with how little Alfred gets to do when he's given the perfect voice actor. I'm hoping we get to see Anthony Stewart Head get another chance to perform as Alfred. And I'm hoping he gets another chance, not because he messed up the first chance, but because this movie messed up by not giving him more attention. This whole movie has a really interesting concept. Having Batman take on the infamous Jack the Ripper. It's not something I would have ever thought of, but then again, neither is Pirate Batman or Joker Batman. Vampire Batman, maybe, but that, that's an easy one. He's a bad person, they're bad people, it just makes too much sense. Jack the Ripper mostly targets women of a certain work environment. Let's call them... sax workers. He specifically goes after sax workers because societally it's quietly accepted. And when I say quietly, I mean shouting at a full volume. Women are being gutted in the streets like wild game, and the Gotham police stand twiddling their thumbs. No ladies have been killed, Miss Kyle. Some gin-soaked women of the street have met their fate, as is common to their kind. These women are seen as lesser than, and because of that, there isn't that big of an investigation or a call to end the Ripper. It would even seem that there are some who support his heinous action. On the police squad. The movie makes it seem like there's only three interested parties in helping these ladies out. Them being none other than our dear Dark Knight, Catwoman minus the cat, and of course, good old Commissioner Gordon. Man, that guy is great and everything. He just... What a good man. Now, normally, Selina Kyle is a character who I think for the most part is out for herself, and always looking out for her own best interest, despite also having a surprisingly soft spot for Batman but I think placing her in this time period and this environment with these specific circumstances where women are being looked down upon like second-class citizens would have a profoundly different effect on the character. Growing up in a certain environment is going to have an effect on your personality and your mentality. When you get down to it, we are who we're allowed to be. So I think she comes off as true to her nature, but given the fact that women at this time are thought so little of, I think her need to look out for herself would become a need to look out for those in her situation. Am I reaching a little bit here? Maybe. But that's my headcanon, and it makes sense to me. So, bite me. The movie does a very good job at creating and building up the mystery of Jack the Ripper. There are several red herrings, with the most prominent being Harvey Dent, who I think played the perfect scapegoat for this plot. Everybody knows that Harvey Dent is Two-Face. A man who, even prior to his scarring, was of two minds. Harvey suffers from dual identities, and there's several references made throughout of Harvey acting different in different situations. On top of that, Harvey's also seen with the top hat, much similar to Jack the Ripper, on a couple of occasions. The plot twist that Jack the Ripper is none other than Jim Gordon himself was an absolute shock to me and my buddy Ray as the first time we watched this movie. And I kind of love it for that. It's not very often that movies surprise me. As someone who constantly ruins movies for his closest friends and family by correctly guessing the ending or plot twist while we're watching the movie, by the way, you can imagine I usually go to the movie theater alone, this is one ending I did not guess. I came nowhere near close to connecting these dots. And I think a big part of the reason is because I felt at ease with these characters. I knew Jim Gordon. It couldn't have been Jim. The fact that it could have been Jim never even crossed my mind. Jim wouldn't do this. That's not his nature. But he did. And I love it for that. The movie was clearly leading us to think that Jack the Ripper was Harvey Dent. There was a scene or two where I thought it might have been too obvious. But hey, maybe this movie is less about the mystery and more about the story in full. I was really banking on Jack the Ripper being Harvey's separate identity. 
But instead, this movie took a risk, and I think it kind of paid off. Now, some of you may say that this is complete destruction of everything we know about Jim Gordon. An honest man who is trying to do good in a corrupt system. The heart of the GCPD. Always doing what's right, even if it's not right for him. How could they write him out to be some sort of woman-hating lunatic? Well, first and foremost, let us remember that this is in fact an Elseworld story. Meaning that these characters aren't the characters we're used to. They're completely different reimaginings of these characters. And secondly, I'd like to point out that this appears to be some sort of amalgamation of both Jim Gordon Sr. and Jim Gordon Jr. Jim Gordon Sr. in name and status, and Jim Gordon Jr. in being a bloodlusting psychopath. The plot twist is one of those twists that make me appreciate the rest of the movie more. I like that it managed to hide this reveal in plain sight. When re-watching certain scenes, it's clear as day. Jim is haunted by nightmares of the Ripper taking the life of his wife. And as a first-time viewer, and someone who's familiar with these characters, I would think that this is just due to the love of his family and fear of what could happen, mixed with the excess time that he spent working on the case. But following the twist re-watching this, you realize it's actually his fear of his own murderous wrath meeting his wife, and having her meet a terrible fate. Or in that same exact scene when Jim is in private with his wife, talking about how he must rid the streets of evil and stop Gotham from, in his own words, going to hell. You would think that he's talking about stopping the Ripper, but in actuality he's talking about cleansing Gotham of the ladies of the night. He feels he's just in his actions by eradicating women of ill repute. I like a lot of the subtle little references they make in passing here. There's not a whole lot of attention put on them, but they're said and done with intention. Like, if you don't know, it's not going to take anything away from the story for you, but if you know, you know. What are you, scared of the dark, little Tim? Nah, it's just after what happened to Johnny Gobbs, I... That ain't real, Timmy. What are you, scared of heights? After what happened to Johnny Gobbs? Hey, look, man, Johnny Gobbs got ripped and took a walk off a roof, all right? No big loss. I heard the bat got him. The bat? Oh, man. Who will face Cyrus Gold? Big Bill Dust territory, interfering with my amiable cock robins. There's plenty more than just Easter eggs here, though. A lot is conveyed about these characters in this world through simple actions. Alfred outwitting a street gang and holding his own well could be an indication of the character's known past with the CIA, or whatever would be the time-appropriate equivalent here. In the movie, they refer to Gotham's Ferris wheel as the Fox Wheel. Now, the Ferris wheel is named that way because the dude who made it was named... something Ferris. Which means in this case, the unseen Lucius Fox is the creator of such. Selena Kyle never dons the cat suit in this, but many mentions of cats are made in reference to her, including eventually her giving her backstory of originally being a lion tamer at the zoo. Listen carefully, kitten. I'm many things, but I'm nobody's pet. Hugo Strange deduces Batman's secret identity, much like he does in the comics and video games. Although there are some things that I openly wonder if they are actual references or maybe I'm just looking into them too much. Like this one always bothered me. Are we supposed to take the old drunkard as this world's Harley Quinn? Because her name is Marlene, which is awfully close to Harleen, which is the original name of Harley Quinn. She acts like an absolute nut much like Harley Quinn, and she's also voiced by Tara Strong, much like Harley Quinn. Also, Jim Gordon damages one side of his wife's face and his brutality sends her into a psychosis. So like, is that just something that happens or is that this version of events is Two-Face? Thoughts in the comment section, I actually want to hear. I think the action in this movie is really, really good. Yes, everything is done on a budget, but I think that they made that budget work. The sequence of events makes every fight scene must-see. This movie demands your utmost attention in these moments. So much as blinking means you're missing the movie's next epic moment. Now, there's two major fight scenes between Batman and the Ripper, one of which takes place on a blimp about to explode, crashing into buildings and ruining the city, and the final battle between good and evil includes hand-to-hand -hand combat amidst a Ferris wheel on fire. That is an accurate description of what happens in this movie. And it is every bit as crazy as it sounds. Maybe even more so. Now, as an adaptation, I would say this movie is rather unfaithful. 
Much like these women, am I right, James? No, seriously, like, it is really unfaithful to the actual comic. Not only is the Ripper not Jim Gordon in that, but the original story didn't even include or mention Catwoman, who is pretty integral to the plot here. She didn't even exist in that telling of the tale. So as an adaptation that faithfully matches its source material, no, this is, this is not great. But on its own merit, I enjoyed this quite a bit. I like its reimagining of these characters. I like that this time period provides a fresh atmosphere for them. And I like that it's something old, but something new at the same time. Not only did it have an interesting environment to tell its story in, it had an interesting story to tell in that environment. It's definitely a more simple telling of the tale than the comic is, but I find that sometimes when you simplify a story, it makes it easier to perfect. Batman Gotham by Gaslight is one of my all-time favorite Batman movies. I would absolutely say this movie is must-see. So if you haven't given it a chance yet, I highly advise you to check it out. With all that being said, I was your least favorite YouTuber, V Infuso, and I thank you for watching. Hope to see you in the next one. I am vengeance. I am the knight. And that was V Infuso. Just remember, if you're not tuning in, then you're missing out. So, if you like the words that came out of his mouth hole, and you too would like to become a V-generate, don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks for watching, nerds! And if you're not joining the fun, you're in for one bad day. And you know what they say about having one bad day. <laughs> Catch him next time. Same bad time. Same bad channel. Gotham by Gaslight, hands down, must watch. If you're into the animated films, especially, this is definitely top favorites. It's just so different, so unique, and it's like a breath of fresh air.